Genesis chapter 1. I wanted to share with you that as I was driving to the church office this morning from my house, I took the back roads because there's construction on 22, and I remember the last minute I was thankful I did, so I didn't hit that traffic. And so I came to the back roads, and I came to one long road that was filled with a lot of shade. There's a lot of trees and the branches that are over this road. Um, But as I continued driving, I came to a point on the road where all of a sudden there was a small area where the trees were not overhanging. And I saw, and you've definitely seen this before, the rays of the sun just shining through that one spot. It was so neat to see, see the light coming through, that great light from the sun that just shined through the trees revealing its light. And as I was driving and I saw that, immediately my mind went to Genesis 1-1 that we're considering tonight. I thought, this is kind of what Genesis 1-1 is like. We open the pages of our Bibles, and right from the very beginning, you and I are introduced to God. Right from the start. The great light of revelation just shines forth in the beginning, God. God does not hesitate to reveal himself to us right from the very beginning of his word. It is here in verse 1, as we will constantly be reminded of, that the rest of the Bible and the rest of history itself flows out of. It's the very foundation. Many have said, if you are wrong here, you will be wrong everywhere else. It is here at the beginning of the Bible that we have the beginning of the heavens and the earth. Time, history, matter, space, the universe. And I want to remind you as we looked at Genesis 1 through 11 from a bird's eye view last week, that the rest of the Bible flows from this foundation. You cannot separate the rest of the Bible from Genesis 1, 1 through 2. So I want to ask you a question. What would you say are some of the basic questions, basic, that you have thought of or asked and the world has thought of or asked about life and reality? Oh. Why is the sky blue? Okay. Why is the sky blue? It's an interesting question. There we go. Where did we come from? It's one. Why did we come into existence at all? Yeah. Why, why, why do we even come into an existence? Yeah. What comes after death? What comes after death? Right. What is death? Why death? Right? Anything else? How did we come? Yeah. How did we come? Why are we being an animal with consciousness? Okay. We're distinct from the animals. But... Um... Okay, how long, like how old is the earth? How, how long have we been, humans, been in existence, right? These are some, some questions that you have thought of, if you haven't said it, that you've pondered. Who is God? What's wrong with the world? I look around and I just see chaos. What's wrong with me, right? What is sin? And these are all questions that every one of us have faced. And many of us look in all the wrong places to find the answer. We look to the world. We look to the school systems. We look to athletes, actors, and actresses. We look to worldly peers. We look to Google and social media and even within. Listen to your heart, you hear. Right? But to look to those sources is to build upon sinking sand. What I pray God would teach you in his word is that even right here in the early chapters of Genesis, you will find the answer to all of these questions that come from the one who is himself truth. And we will consider these questions and address them as we walk through Genesis 1 through 11. We obviously won't consider all of those tonight. But I want to direct your attention to what to the first two verses of Genesis 1, because it is here in these small verses 
that we have such grand truth before us. And I want to invite you to stand with me as we read Genesis 1, 1 through 2. This will be a short scripture reading, but there is so much in these two verses. This is what God's word says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Let's pray because we need God's help in understanding His Word. Heavenly Father, I thank You so much for Your Word. God, I thank You so much that You have revealed Yourself clearly. God, the problem is not with the clarity of Your revelation. It's the sin of our hearts. We're blinded, God. We cannot see apart from your spirit opening our eyes to see. God, every single one of us in this room, whether in Christ or outside of Christ, there is a sense within us, no matter how deep that sense might be, that we're suppressing it, that you are there and you are not silent. That you have created the heavens and the earth. That you are the God that we are accountable to. God, I pray tonight that you would not just... Take your word to the ears of these students and leaders, but take it to their hearts. I cannot do that, God. Only you can. And it's by being faithful to your word that your spirit works. So God, would you help us tonight to stay alert? I pray that these students would see how important these truths are for the very fundamental questions of life. What is life? Who are you, God? Where did we come from? Pray that we would listen closely and that your spirit would give us attentiveness to your word. God, and as always, show us Christ. In this passage, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you may be seated. We're going to start right away by looking at the first point I want you to see in this passage. And that is God, the almighty creator. If you look at verse 1, this is how it starts. In the beginning, God. As I said earlier, immediately we are introduced to God himself. Right at the beginning of the Bible, God shines forth and reveals himself to us. But notice verse 1 says, in the beginning. This refers to the beginning of time. This refers to the beginning of creation. In fact, this refers to the beginning of everything. And what the Bible communicates, please hear me, is not God's beginning, but God at the beginning. The first thing you and I need to know right from the start is that God is eternal and he is self-existent. This means he has no beginning. He has no end. God was God. God is God. He continues to be God and he will forever be God. He is the uncreated creator. And Moses, who is the human author here of Genesis, wrote one psalm, and that is Psalm 90, verse 2. And he says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You see, before the beginning, there was no universe. No earth, no planets and stars, no time and space, no air, no molecules or atoms, not even a single particle. Before the beginning, there was God And God alone. The second thing you and I need to know from verse 1 is that God is self-sufficient. Does anyone know what that means? Feel free to raise your hand. What does it mean that God is self-sufficient, Jonathan? He doesn't need anything else to remain. Exactly, right? He doesn't need anything outside of himself. He is in need of nothing and is dependent upon no one or anything. And you and I are not that way. What What are some things that we are dependent on? Water. Okay. Anyone else? Food. Food. That's right. Amen. Being with other people. Community. That's right. Air. Air. Oxygen. Right? These are, one more. Yeah. Shelter. Shelter. Right? We, we are dependent upon many things. God is not that way. He's not dependent upon anything. He is sufficient in and of himself. There, or otherwise, he would not be God. You see, everything could cease to exist in a moment and God would still be. Would you and I learn from this that God does not need us? 
He did not create because he was lonely. He did not create because he needed creatures for his comfort. God created because he freely chose to do so in grace. And what we see in verse 1 is in the beginning, God created. God is before everything. And what we see is that all things, including you and I, have their beginning from him. He is the creator and everything else is the creation. And when we read verse 1, and we read, In the beginning, God, the name in the Hebrew that God uses to reveal himself here, in the very beginning, is Elohim. What does that mean? El, which simply means God or the Mighty One. And then the ending here in the Hebrew is what is referred to in the Hebrew language as majestic plural. What that means simply is El means mighty one or powerful one, but when you have Elohim in the plural, it means the almighty one, the all-powerful one. This means that there is no power in the entire universe that does not come from God. What a thought to just ponder on for a moment. Even the power that you use to get into the car for youth group, to play the games outside, to then walk inside and sit down in your very seat where you are. And the power that keeps you going is all from God. We possess derived power. God himself is power. It, he is the source of it. And what we see is in the beginning, verse 1, God created. The word used here for create in the Hebrew is one that is only used in the Bible to refer to God himself. It's only used in reference to him. Why? Because it refers to creating something out of nothing, which only God has done. You see, when we create things, you think of like a cell phone or a car or a plane, a watch, whatever it may be. Those materials are already there. They're already laid out. And what that person does or the machines that were also created with materials is they take the materials and they bring them together. But those materials were already there. God, on the other hand, when he created, he created all things out of nothing. He does not use material. He does not use parts for nothing existed before the beginning except God and God alone. God simply spoke and it was. And with infinite power and infinite wisdom, God spoke all things into existence. And I want to say clearly, God did not do this over millions or billions of years. We will see more of that next week. God created by the power of his word in six consecutive days, 24 hour periods of time, morning and evening. He created all things. And look at verse 1 again. What did he create? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the heavens. Steve Lawson says the word heavens is in the plural. And the idea is everything that's up there. It includes all that is above the earth. It means the heights of heights. The sky above, the stars and planets, the sun, all of the galaxies, the solar system, heaven itself. And Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Then we see he created the earth. This literally speaks of the earth upon which you and I live now. And the way in which the Hebrew is used in verse 1 when it says the heavens and the earth is a figure of speech that implies and everything else in between. To kind of give an illustration as one brother has given before when you say from coast to coast and all that is in between. God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in between. Because you see, without God, there is no heaven and earth. There is no in the beginning unless you have God who is before the beginning. There was not a big bang that brought all things into existence. There was not evolution that unfolded over billions of years. There was only God who is before the beginning, who out of nothing spoke all things into existence. And I want to read to you a quote 
from R.C. Sproul. Listen to this. If anything exists now, then there never could have been a time when there was nothing. Because the most fundamental maxim of all reason and all science and all philosophy is the maxim, out of nothing, nothing comes. If there was ever a time when there was nothing, the only thing there could possibly be now could not possibly be now. Not even a little something. Not even a microscopic something. Not even a subatomic something. If there was ever a time when there was nothing, there would be nothing now. So there always had to be something. Something that had the very power of being within itself or nothing could possibly be. If the equation is God or chance, the only possible solution is God because chance can do nothing. I want to say this. Believing in God and believing that he created all things is not an ignorant problem if you don't believe. Romans 1 tells us it's a moral problem. It's because of our sin in our heart. Paul says we take the truth that is evident about God and in our unrighteousness, we we push it down and we try to shun it out. Because Hebrews 11.3 says this, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. And what that implies is it was made by the one who is invisible. Creation demands a creator. And just to close with point number one, I want to quote Steve Lawson again. He says, God is the only biblical, rational, reasonable explanation for the universe and even for your existence. The only explanation is God, the Almighty. You are not the product of this world. Please hear this. You are not the product of society. You are not the product of culture. You are the product of God. You are created in the image of God. That's where your identity, value, and worth comes from. What a glorious truth. Let's look at point number two. The earth, formless, empty, and dark. Look look at verse two. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of of the deep. I first want to point this out, which was such an interesting discovery in my study of this passage. I want to ask you, you can feel free to answer. Out of all the heavens above that we saw was created by God, all that which God created in verse 1, where does his focus specifically go to in verse 2? At all the heavens, the earth. The earth. The earth. Out of all that he created, it would be on the earth that he will create all which follows in chapter 1. Including man and woman. It will be upon the earth that he will promise after the fall in Genesis 3 that one is going to come into the earth. And it will be upon the earth that the fulfillment of that promise happens. That it would be upon the earth that God himself will enter into his own creation. Jesus, the son of God, who will take on flesh and walk upon the earth, live a perfect righteous life that I could never live, and then be crucified upon a cross on the earth, taking the wrath of God upon himself that you and I deserve, and he would rise again on the earth, and it is Jesus who will come again at the end of the age to the earth. It is the earth that God has chosen to unfold his plan of redemption and all of human history. But we see here in verse 2, the state in which the earth was in at this time, in verse 2. I'm going to just flow through that. First, we see in the verse, it was without form. This means it was without shape. It was desolate. It was empty. Nothing is there at this time. So when God first created the earth, there was no creature upon it yet. It was without life. It was without light. It did not yet have form as it will be when we get to the end of chapter 1. All the matter and the materials, they were there, but God was not finished. What we see is God is the divine architect who will take all that he spoke into existence And perfectly bring it all together and bring about order and beauty and light and life. It was without form. 
Secondly, it was void. This simply means it was empty. There was no life at all and there was no one to inhabit the earth at this time. It was, as the verse says, void. Thirdly, it was dark. There was no light at all. It was completely full of darkness. If you've ever been in a room where there was no light and you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face, it's kind of what it was like. It was darkness. So there was no light, no life, and it was emptiness at this time. Fourth, it was completely underwater. Verse 2 and verse 9 implies that. We see that the deep mentioned in the first half of verse 2 is parallel to the waters in the end of verse 2. So the earth was without form, it was empty, it was dark, and it was completely under water because God had not yet parted the waters to bring about dry land in verse 9. And what we will see is this is not the last time we will hear that the earth is completely underwater. So we have the earth. Thirdly, last point, is the Spirit of God comes and moves. Look at the end of verse 2. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Here we see that God was not distant. God was not far off. Rather, He is near and He is present. And once again, we see the Spirit of God come and move upon the earth. And though God is omnipresent, which means there's not a place you could possibly go where He's not there, it is here the Spirit of God descends and comes specifically upon the earth as God's glorious power and infinite wisdom would be displayed upon the earth when He takes what is without form and gives it form. When He takes what is empty and fills it. When He takes what is dark and says, let there be light in verse 3. And when he takes what is completely covered by water and brings forth the land, it would be upon the earth that God would, as one brother says, showcase his glory. And we see here in verse 2, the Spirit of God was hovering. In other words, moving. This is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Because we know God is a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And the word used here, I want you to hear this, for hovering is the same Hebrew word that is used in Deuteronomy 32.11, which says this, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters or hovers over its young. So as the eagle hovers over its nest, preparing for its eggs to hatch and bring forth the life of eaglets, The Spirit hovers over the earth as it prepares to bring forth light and life upon it. See, the Spirit of God is hovering over the face of the waters upon the earth, preparing, as I've already said, to bring form where there's none, to fill the emptiness, to shine forth light where there is darkness, to bring form, beauty, design, and order. And what we will see as we study this chapter further in the next couple of weeks is that the triune God will create upon the earth all that He ordained to create in six consecutive days. I want to take the remainder of our time to give you application from these three points. First, we take this by faith from the Word of God because our finite minds cannot wrap around and comprehend the triune God. The Creator of all things is our Lord Jesus Christ. John 1, 1 through 3. Tell me if this sounds familiar. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1, 16. For by Him, Christ... All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him. And listen to this for him. You were created for God. You were created for Christ. 
What I want you to get out of this is, listen, Jesus is the one who is meek and lowly. He came so low by becoming a man, taking on human flesh. We know born in a manger, but do not think upon his humanity to the extent that you forget that he is God. He himself was present with the Father and the Spirit in the beginning because he himself is God. And Jesus, who is truly God, the Son of God, will enter into this same creation that he spoke into being. He comes so low so that he may redeem sinners like you and I through his life, death, and resurrection. Secondly, as we considered the state of the earth in verse 2, we need to understand that this shows us something of where you and I are when we are outside of Christ. You see, we are all naturally in spiritual darkness. And we are all naturally empty, void, apart from Christ. We try and try to fill the emptiness of our hearts with temporal things, with the things of this world, and the constant yearning for more and more and more only shows that these things will never truly fill and satisfy. We had no spiritual life within our souls. We are naturally enemies of God with a spiritually dead heart of stone. But God, just as the Spirit of God came and moved over the empty, dark earth, the Spirit of God comes to the sinner upon hearing the Word of God, upon hearing the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And God comes and He speaks into your heart and soul, let there be light. And there is light. For the first time when that happens to you, you see God clearly for who He is. And you see yourself in your sin for who you truly are. And the Spirit of God brings conviction upon your heart for your sinfulness and rebellion against God. But the Spirit at the same time also carries your eyes to see Jesus clearly and what He accomplished on the cross in your place. You see, God, the almighty creator, is also God, the merciful redeemer. The one who breathed life into Adam is the one who can breathe life into your soul spiritually. You cannot save yourself. You cannot earn salvation. You need God himself to intervene and open your spiritually blind eyes to see Christ and his cross clearly so that you come running to him alone in repentance in saving faith. I cannot urge you enough. If you have never come to Jesus, tonight could be the night that you come to him in saving faith. Because this same God that you see here at the beginning, you're going to stand before in the end. You will stand before him with the books opened in the courtroom of heaven. All that you've ever done. Everything you thought, everything you spoke, It will be laid out. Revelation says you will have no ground to stand upon because you have nothing to boast in of your own. You will stand before God as your judge. But the Bible says all those who come to Jesus, who repent and turn to him alone in saving faith and recant anything of their own and come and embrace him alone in saving faith, the Bible says he's our advocate. So that one day when you do stand before him and the books are open and there's the question, why should I let you in? Our boast will be because he, because he alone is my plea. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much, God, for your truth. God, I thank you for your son. Lord, you were not obligated to save any single one of us, but you freely chose in your grace to set your love upon sinners. Oh God, would we understand the difference between justice and grace? Justice is we all go to hell because we deserve it because of our sin. But God, you are a gracious God. You have sent your son to live the life I could never live and die the death I deserve. 
Lord, this is the gospel in which we stand as we sang before. God, I pray for anyone in this room or that does not know you, that they would not hesitate to talk to one of us, one of the leaders about the gospel and how they can come to know you. God, we don't, I'm not, I don't do altar calls here, or raise of hands. Lord, I trust that your spirit will do the work that it does, that he does. God, would you call lost sinners to yourself and I pray us as your people in this room tonight that we would be edified, encouraged, exhorted, and brought to greater awe of you and your son and your spirit. As all these things in Jesus' name, amen.